We're live from our studios here in Kokumlemle on digital address GA0992539. Today we assess the future of Ghana's COVID-19 vaccination program as delays in the receipt of the next tranche of AstraZeneca doses is imminent. The Ghana Health Service says over 70% of protection is guaranteed for the first dose takers till after 12 weeks. We interrogate that further. And as we hear from the service, and touch base with the northern region where some of the doses were told have expired. Two fire outbreaks begin the week for residents in the Ashanti region, one at the leather and footwear section of the Kumasi Central Market and the other, the administration block of the Mampong Technical College of Education in Asante Mampong. Broadcasting law communique and striking down fake news content and taking down media houses who air unethical media content. We unpack the details of what could become a new broadcasting law with the input of stakeholders. We engage the Media Foundation for West Africa on the matter. The pause is brought to you by Global Communities, Digni Lu, Affordable Safe Sanitation. Join us on DSTV 421 Go TV 144. We're streaming live on YouTube and on our other social media handles. My name is Gifty Andor Pia. This is The Pulse. Please be my guest. Now, the Communication Ministry is hinting of plans to implement some provisions in the Electronic Communication Act, which legalizes the clampdown of fake news on social media. Sector Minister Esla Uswe Kufu says the dissemination of fake news is affecting lives and destroying content generated by traditional media. The content of that legislation depends on all of you as practitioners. And it is not enough to sit by and watch the process unfold without taking active part and interest in it, and then later criticizing what you had an opportunity to make an input into. So can't say that what has happened is good, but there's a silver lining to every cloud. If for nothing at all, the imperative of having a set of regulations to guide the content that we produce is now apparent to all of us. And I believe that as men and women of goodwill, we will work together to ensure that we serve our nation well in this area as well. And while we're at it, we need to look at the ease with which fake news is also spreading around us based on the social media platforms that we have. And now there's a convergence between traditional and new media. And it, the, the lines are blurred because you, the traditional media practitioners, are taking your content from social media and vice versa. So the rules which guide traditional media must also be crafted in such a way that it can also guide the new media as well. How do we do that? We need to think through, look at best practices from around the world and see how we can sanitize this space so that what we read on new and social media we can accept as largely credible. If the proliferation of fake news undermines the integrity of the work that you do, you will be the losers because it will only breed skepticism and cynicism about the content of the media, uh, the information that is published out there. And ultimately, it will affect your output. So let's all work together to see how we can use the current tools that are at our disposal. And there's something in the Electronic Communications Act which makes it possible for us to pull down content that is false, misleading, or criminal broadcast on electronic platforms. It's there. We've never used it. But it's time for us to look at, and I'm sure that um, the legal uh, director of the NCA in his presentation will deal with some of these issues. Asla Ousoko for the Minister for Communication. Meanwhile, government has set up a 13-member committee to monitor and recommend for sanction media houses in breach of unethical, in breach of ethical content. Information Minister Kojo Opong Kruma says the sanctions include withdrawal of licenses. 
In particular, the framers of our Constitution and our forebears had a special place for media in our democracy and our national life. Over the years, Ghana has worked to deepen these freedoms by, for example, repealing the criminal libel law, and quite recently, enacting a Right to Information Act aimed at providing a freer space for public discourse. Colleague ministers, invited guests, a 2020 Afrobarometer report released by the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, suggests that the majority of Ghanaians support media freedoms in Ghana. Therefore, we all have a collective responsibility to ensure that the media continues to operate freely, to ensure that the media freedoms are protected, and more importantly, to ensure that the emerging threats to media practice in Ghana are kept. One such threat is the sharp rise of content described as unwholesome or inappropriate by various segments of the Ghanaian society that are popping up on our broadcasting platforms. These include but are not limited to the constant portrayal of money doubling on our television, the regular seeming promotion of social vices and even sometimes criminal activity, including ritual murders, pornography, and advertising of unapproved products on our broadcasting platforms. A number of questions come up. Fundamentally, there's a question of what qualifies as inappropriate content on our screens or on our broadcast platforms. Secondly, there's a question of who determines what is inappropriate. Thirdly, there's a question of how this determination is made. Fourthly, what remedies are currently available or ought to be made available in the near future? A fifth item is what are the current legal tools available for dealing with challenges of this nature, assuming we agree that these are challenges that must be dealt with. How do we ensure that such tools are not abused by persons who may seek to claw back on our cherished media freedoms? How do we get regulators to use the current legal framework and to protect the public and even the media itself from inappropriate or supposedly inappropriate content. If there has ever been the need to take up this challenge, the time is now. The last time the National Media Commission attempted to enact a legislative instrument to address these emerging challenges, the LI was shot down as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, and perhaps rightly so. But within the current body of laws, among regulators, we believe there's room to find common ground to deal with some of these emerging challenges, even as we prepare to properly legislate in the area of broadcasting. Honorable ministers, ladies and gentlemen, another matter, another set of matters worth considering are the proposals that have been put forth for the soon to be enacted broadcasting law. After several years of consultation and engagement, the time has come for us to conclude our conversations on what is currently the bill and proceed to lay same before Parliament, hopefully for passage. However, some emerging issues such as the following are coming up and should engage our attention in these final parts of our consultation. Kojo Pong Nkrumah is Minister for Information. Suleiman Abraima is Executive Director of the Media Foundation for West Africa. He's joining me on the phone right now. Uh, Mr. Abraima, thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Um, let me start by taking your initial ass assessment of how government has gone about this particular uh, bill and the quest to make it law in, in the processes that are ongoing currently and the matters arising. Let's start with your initial assessment. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I think that the, the process, I would say, um, has been great. We are in an era where participatory um, lawmaking is the way to go. The broadcasting bill has been on the table for close to two decades now. Mm. And so if we've gotten to a point where we now want to um, activate it, I think the right thing to do is what is happening mm. by way of bringing stakeholders and actors together and brainstorming together so that at the end of the day, we can build consensus on what would work and what would not work. Okay. And this is critical because Doing this involves trying to define a very thin line uh, around preserving the freedoms that our Constitution 
guarantee, and at the same time making sure that uh, those freedoms are exercised in ways that would not compromise our democracy, would not compromise the progress of our society in any way. So it's a fine, there's a fine line around censorship and you know, uh, responsible uh, conduct among media practitioners. And so I think it's been a great process so far. It has been, um, it's just the beginning, but if it is, this is how it would go, I'm sure that at the end of the day, we would all have a piece of legislation that will serve the common interests of our people. Let's take a look at the details now. Must media practitioners at this point be worried about what appears, as they put it, to be the possible use of either the proposed broadcasting bill or the current Electronic Communication Act to regulate media content? Well, not at all. I, I think that media practitioners or media organizations would by now appreciate the fact that if only you would want to be professional, if, you, if only you would want to do the business of journalism, then an unregulated environment is actually a threat rather than having a regulation that would sort of help um, refine the context and refine the ecosystem for all of us to practice in an atmosphere of decorum. So um, if you talk about the Electronic Transactions Act or Electronic Communications Act or the NCA Act, which empowers the NCA to take certain decisions or remedial actions, these are laws already. So even without the broadcasting law that is being worked on, if the NCA decides that they would want to apply the law as required by it, I'm sure nothing stops them, except that, of course, on matters of content and all of that, the NCA would then lack the capacity to be able to act. So I guess what is happening is, look, we, we started this a regime in 1993, liberalized the airways. At the time, we had just one radio station, a state monopoly, we got into this liberalized environment without, you know, working around what it is that we, we needed to do. And um, I think under the circumstance, uh, as it's, it's better late than never. And so mm. it's, it's, it's right that we approach it now. As we approach it now, like you said, there, there has to be space for genuine mis, mis, mistakes. Uh, there has to also be the guard against a deliberate attempt by people in government to clamp down on certain media organizations that they, know, they don't necessarily agree with. Those are some of the concerns that have come up. What advice would you give, especially for those who are a part of the consultative process, as the critical areas to pay attention to? Well, I think that, um, as I said, no one should entertain uh, fears about the process. If only you would want to do um, good journalism. I think the process is actually one that will further enhance um, the freedoms that are guaranteed. We all do have to recognize that Article 164 of our Constitution, even as 162 and all the subsections under it, provides for the guarantees and all of that. 164 also made a provision that we needed to have a piece of legislation that would ensure that in our practice we do it in such a way that it would uh, adhere to the principles of morality, principles of public order, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the other great thing is that it is not, this is not a government that is going to, I mean, it's not, it's not an action that is going to be undertaken by government. It is something that is coming under the statutory regulatory body that we all have been working with, which is the National Media Commission which is an independent commission. Uh, and I believe that at the end of the day, uh, no one will be happy to have the commission begin to take certain actions that would undermine mm. the freedoms that we are supposed to all have. If anything at all, I think the decisions will be ones that would further enhance the freedoms that the media must have. Um, and, and the fact that the constitution says no censorship, I don't think that this will be a mechanism to uh, begin to have the N NMC try to censor content and so on and so forth. So I think it's a process that we should all abide by. Um, as I did say, we should have done this way back. Mm. We, we have slept on the job um, to a point where we have almost been overwhelmed by the situation. But the steps that are being taken, I believe, are the right steps. And going forward, we should be able to correct what we have failed to correct in the past. The communication minister in addressing uh, uh, the consultative uh, stakeholders meeting indicated that 
we have to find a way of applying the part of the law that allows us to pull down content that are deemed false, that are deemed misleading, um, etc. I mean, I know that it is clear when something is false, it is clear. But I'll give you the, the, the typical example of, about the, uh, the new, uh, if, if you like, the grading. The grading that came up from the World Bank about uh, Ghana being, not being a um, middle income uh, status and all the bruhaha that came around it. For issues that have, you know, very blurred lines of clarity when it comes to categorization of fake news or whatever it is. How do we regulate all of these without necessarily taking people on when they've made genuine mistakes? Well, um, it's a very complex issue when you, you now get into the terrain of digital and platform communication. Um, a lot of countries are currently struggling with that. Germany tried to be a pioneer in this, in this field um, when it, it, in 2017, in June 2017, um, their Bundestag passed what they called the uh, Network Enforcement Act 2017, which came into force in January 20, 2018. But sooner, I mean, soon after it came into force, it was realized that it was quite complex than perhaps the government in Germany had thought, because there were obligations on the part of platforms like Facebook, Google, or YouTube to take down content. And it almost became like, well, the law is empowering these platforms to become censored. And that was not the intention. Other countries, you know, which tried to follow up, Russia um, and, and a few other countries referencing the German law, also realized that it's a quite a complex thing. In the conversation that we had last week, I think there were situations about what we could possibly do with the emerging issues around fake news, false information, and so on and so forth. And my position was that it is practically impossible mm -hmm. to try and cater for all those issues within a single broadcasting legislation. And I believe that if you take the UK example, where uh, in 2019, they tried to have a digital oversight uh, body and in the end, there was a conversation and a discussion around whether it should be part of the Ofcom, which is the Broadcasting Authority, or they should have a separate digital authority to deal with matters of digital issues, matters of fake news, and so on and so forth. I would go with the latter, that perhaps we are at a point where we need to have a conversation, whether we must have a separate body that would be responsible for dealing with matters of content, uh, when it, um, matters of you know digital platforms, so the, the Facebook posts, the YouTube posts, and mm. so on and so forth. I don't think that at this stage we can have all that being catered for in a single broadcasting legislation. And it's a okay. complex thing. We need to give it time as we go on. We need to learn more about it. We need to study the trends. People are doing OTT broadcasting. People are sitting in the U.S. and broadcasting over the net and are targeting Ghanaian audience and so on. So even if you have a piece of legislation here, mm. what do you do? Are you going to empower the NCA to say, look, you can take down certain URL or you can block certain content? Are you going to say to Facebook, look, if you don't take down this content, we are going to you know, impose a fine with Facebook badge, given that we are a tiny country and in terms of our contribution, not much. So that requires its own conversation. But I believe that if somebody sits on TV now and say they are doubling money, they are giving little numbers, they are spiritualists, and so on and so forth, those are not matters that we, we have to continue to wait. And I believe the committee that is envisaged to be uh, established by the National Media Commission would be so powered to be able to deal with matters um, like that. Mr. Barima, I'll say a very big thanks to your time. Uh, Thanks for your time. Uh, this is still a conversation that we can have subsequently uh, looking at the content, what's going in it and what uh, can be done by the key stakeholders. Thank you. Suleiman Abrahima has the Media Foundation for West Africa there. The former Deputy Attorney General and Minister for Justice, Dr. Dominika Yene, has called for reforms in Ghana's sentencing regime 
Speaking on personality profile, he told host Aisha Ibrahim that some of the sentences handed to offenders are sometimes unjustifiable and are economically burdensome to the state. Well, the, for me, I think the most important one is the criminal justice system. Mm. I, I think that uh, we need to look into the sentencing regime um, because I think that the sentences that are being handed down uh, to persons who commit all kinds of offenses are not, uh, they are not justified. They are economically burdensome to the, to the state, to the, to the republic. So I, I mean, for instance, if someone is caught with a roll of wheat, I mean, for God's sake, you, you don't want to send that person to 10, 10 years, you know, I mean, in hard labor in, in someone, right? And I've had to defend people, I remember, you know, I won't mention the name, but a young lady who was working with DHL, a parcel came through, you know, um, she processed the parcel, not knowing that the parcel was, you know, had a weed under it with chocolate at it, I mean, um, on top. On of top. It. So the person came and thought, was pretending to send chocolate to uh, the UK, not knowing that it was weed the person was sending. So when along the line it was discovered, you know, she was arrested. Um, the Nigerian guy who came in, they sent the parcel, ran away, and then I had to defend her. And mm. eventually, she was given, I think, uh, was it 15 years, you know, um, wow. with hard labor. Wow. So, it, it, for me, I, I think those are things that we need to look at. I mean, mm. sentence, the sentencing regime should not, I mean, it should be um, reformed so that it is less burdensome on the, on the, this in the Republic, and it is also, um, not destructive of the lives of you know young people in particular i mean especially young offenders who are offending for the first time and so on i think we need to look at that very carefully well, dr dominic Ayene is also advocating reforms of the standing orders of parliament to allow for more scrutiny of key government business on the floor he's calling for special provision that will require at least two-thirds of mps to agree before the House can approve loans brought before Parliament by government. He insists he, he's, the current system where decisions are made by majority votes does not ensure judicious use of national resources. I think the A Parliament, Ghanaians expect it to be different. Ghanaians expect us to hold the government's feet to the fire more frequently than we did. The fact is that, um, unfortunately, most of the decisions in parliament are by a simple majority. In fact, one of the things that I would have wanted us to do is to change the standing orders, mm. to require a, a super majority vote on certain weighty national issues. Mm. So for instance, if you have a government that is borrowing too, too I mean, it's engaging too much borrowing, all right? And, and I'm not talking about this, I mean, a current government alone, all right? We also, we also had a share of borrowing. All right, but if you have a, you know, you think that the loans are not, you know, really going to help the republic, you should require that the, before approval, you should have a two-thirds majority mm. of members. And if you make that requirement, if that of two-thirds majority approval, it will become difficult for governments to just, you know, at the, I mean, a, a drop of a, a, a pin, <clears throat> run to the international market to borrow money. Mm. Now look at our debt, you know, to G GDP, I mean, ratio, mm. almost 80%. 80, 80 that mm. is not, I mean, sustainable. Mm. So I think that that is one aspect that we need to change. We need to enact um, an international economic and business uh, act that makes it possible, you know, for us to scrutinize uh, the loans and the, uh, you know, e economic transactions like power purchase agreements and so on in a way that uh, enhances public welfare. Mm. You know, we should be more focused on making sure that governments, you know, I mean, uh, account to the people more, uh, you know, um, more diligently. Dr. Dominic Ayene there speaking with Aisha Ibrahim on personality profile. This is still the pause with me, Gifty. And Dorpia, did you take the first dose of the COVID vaccination? Well, I'm sure by now you're expecting. You want to know when next the second dose or the second shot will be given. We're not so sure which date, but at least we know that we're still protected, those of us who have. That is the next conversation I'll be having. I'll be engaging the Ghana Health uh, Service on when 
we expected to have the next dose and to what extent are we protected with a single dose. Just stay with us. President Akufado will soon release a list of nominees for deputy ministerial appointees after consultations with the substantive ministers on their deputies as required by Article 79 Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution. The delay in releasing the list has created anxiety and some sort of panic within government. But join us is learning that the presidency will make the list available this uh, will make the the list available today and we're looking forward to receiving that particular list so we can have a conversation uh, about it we'll hear from political analysts shortly but presidential correspondent elton Brobe is joining me right now with more hello elton yes good see elton tell us what this uh, meeting we understand happened last night is about all right so the meeting uh, so the there has been a series of meetings. Right. Uh, the last one was uh, just last night. The president was out of the country over the weekend. He was in Congo, rather uh, But before that, uh, after opening the national dialogue on illegal mining, uh, he met all the designates for deputy ministerial positions. Uh, and some of them are confirmed to us uh, in, 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 in interviews that indeed They've invited, they've been told that uh, they will be named as deputy ministers for various uh, ministerial positions. And for now, I'm just waiting for the official communication to come from the president so that they can start their work properly. And this meeting took place uh, Wednesday evening, after which the president embarked on that uh, foreign uh, tour in Congo Brazzaville as special guests of the integration of their president. So. Uh, that was Wednesday evening. Now, what I'll be picking is that there was also another meeting uh, last night, which ironed out some differences some had raised about the list and some people who were working with them. I'm talking about some of the attentive ministers. Now, the information we have is that everything is now done and dusted, and in, the, in, in some few hours to come, we'll have the full component. Elton, looks like I'm losing you there. Let me, let's try this once again. Uh, Elton, if you can hear me, you were just telling us about the fact that it looks like, like everything is done and dusted. All we have to now expect is the list out. Exactly, Gifty. I was talking about the fact that all differences, all concerns I'm told that have been ironed out uh, at a special meeting that uh, was called by the president uh, to address some concerns that had been raised at, at last Wednesday's meeting, which looked at uh, the the nominees for the various deputy ministerial positions, so that is well done. So, in the next, in some few hours, we are likely to hear the official announcement that will come from the president. Even though in the media cycle we've been told of several names, speculations uh, going about, uh, you know, mm -hmm. giving giving indication as well. This is what we have done so far here at Join is to look at. Uh, the list from our sources and also from the people who were at that particular meeting on Wednesday who have been contacted and have given their consent to be appointed as deputy minister. Some of them have confirmed to us. Now, at that particular meeting, President Kufuani anyway declared that apart from the Energy and the Finance Ministry, all other ministries will have just two deputies. So, apart from the, uh, the Energy as well as the finance ministry, all other ministers will have two, will have three, will have two deputies. So energy will have three deputies, and finance will have two, uh, three deputies. Now this afternoon we we'll have information that the uh, former deputy minister in the first administration of President of Kufuwa, the Charles Adibuahem, has been elevated to the position of a minister of state at the finance ministry. So apart from him, there will be other two deputies. And we are told that Abena Osiya Sari, a member of parliament for Akiwa East, as well as John Kuma, the member of parliament for the district government in the Ashanti region, who will assist the finance minister as two deputies, while Charles Edouard is elevated as minister of state at the finance ministry. For the energy ministry also, President Kufadi may declare that one of them was going to come from the Western region. We are told that Elton, sorry, if I may just jump in there. I want us to stay a little bit on the, on the, on the finance ministry. Um, let's let's just stay a little bit there. So what it means is that we'll have three other persons working with the finance minister, except that uh, Charles Edouard is in the position as minister of state. 
do we understand the, the dynamics of that? It, what's the difference here? Will he be operating from the presidency, as usually the ministers of state have done, or will he be at the finance ministry? Of course, he will be operating from the finance ministry, and this will not be the first time somebody has been appointed as minister of state at the finance ministry. Remember that in the president before, uh, second term in the office, Dr. Anthony Abitos, uh, the former member of parliament for Tapu Bantono, uh, who has served as deputy minister in the first term of president of Ufado, President Kufo was elevated to the, to the status of the Minister of State at the Finance Ministry. President, President Kufo back then said that it was due to his competence and the fact that he was able to organize the Finance Ministry in the absence of the substantive minister. So this will be the second time we will have somebody uh, in that position as the Minister of State at the Finance Ministry. Charles Odubo and obviously will be written from the uh, Finance Ministry as the Minister of State. So clearly he will be above. Uh, the, the two deputies, I've been mean, sorry, okay. and John Kuma, the member of parliament for uh, Jamin in the Shanti region. We are okay. also told that there will also be, that there's likely to be another person nominated as a minister of state. And this time, my information, the information I'm picking is that a member of parliament for Epiapim South, Obi Amwa, who served as deputy local government minister in the first term of President of Kufaru administration, is being considered for a minister of state at the local government ministry. So that's also something that we are learning. Okay. We are waiting to uh, see the confirmation Concern. of that particular one. Right. Uh, so, but so let's move on to the energy. The energy mm, and the yeah. finance ministry, all other, all other uh, ministries will have either one or two deputies. You are talking to us about giving us the information about uh, the energy ministry, the details of the names we are picking up as those going to the energy ministry. So for the energy ministry, we are told of the member of parliament for second D, uh, Ejapa, uh, as one of the deputies. Also, Dr. Amin, uh, Mohammed Amin, the member of parliament for Karaga, he was a deputy minister for the energy ministry and will still be going there as a deputy minister for energy. And also we have picked the name of uh, William Urekuedu, who was a deputy minister in charge of power in the uh, first term of president of the member of parliament for Exigia. South in the Ashanti region, going back to the same ministry as a deputy minister for energy. So the energy ministry also has three deputies. We are more required to Japan Minister of uh, Second D, the Second D MP, as well as the Karaga MP, uh, Dr. Mohammed Amin. Uh, these are the three names we have picked uh, as deputy ministers for the energy ministry. And the overall minister, as as you are aware, is Dr. Maj Poko Frempe. Mm. And, and Elton, do we know about any other, are there any other um, ministries that you'd like to share with us uh, that uh, uh, come to you off head at the point, at this point? Otherwise, um, I, I mean, if I know you have the list there. If we, if we can go through, we can go and through that, the list. Exactly, that, that is what I'm trying to do now. So <laughs> okay, okay. So, so, so that's and fine. Then, and then go to the list for you, Gifty. Very well. So that's Elton Brobe. Elton Brobe is our presidential affairs correspondent. Now, what we do know is that the list, the substantive list of who becomes a deputy minister in this last administration of President Ekufado should be out. In fact, we understood that it would be out about 3 p.m. So a little, a little about 30 minutes. Uh, a little more than 30 minutes above three o'clock and so we're expecting that confirmation pretty soon but elton is now going through for me the names that we have that our sources have shared with us some of the people involved uh you know we've confirmed uh this conversation has as you know has been had with them and so elton is just taking us through the names he just told us about the energy and the finance ministries which uh, as elton posted will have about two between two to three ministers but every other minister every other sector will have about one between one and two elton do you have the list to take us through now so this is the list we have and this is based on people we've spoken to people who were at this uh, meeting last wednesday where the meeting was more like an orientation for them ahead of the, the, the official announcement that we are expecting today. So okay. I spoke about the finance ministry and mm -hmm. the energy ministry. Now I can go and talk about the trade and industry ministry. So the names we have here include uh, the, the, the member of parliament for New Jersey South, uh, Michael uh, Perfi, uh, as well as Herbert Kraber. Herbert Kraber used to be a press secretary to President Kufuado somewhere around 2012. And he is back in government, 
uh, in the first term, he was government spokesperson on governor. And now my information is that he's been nominated as a deputy minister for trade. That's the best up. And uh, the other nominees are Michael Oshibefi, the member of parliament for New Jersey South in the Eastern region. Education, John in Team Fodjo, Reverend John in Team Fodjo, and it's June. I'm powerful. They are not new to this ministry, especially if the two man purple. John in Team Fodjo is joining. And the sector minister, as you are aware, is Dr. Yao Chichun. Mm. But as Attorney General Ministry, uh, Minister of Justice, we have two deputies, Diana Asunaba Dapa, currently lecturer at Kempa, and Alfred Shayabu. Alfred Shayabu is based in Sinan in Rebona Hapo, he's a private legal practitioner. Uh, he came to prominence in the run up to the 2020 election where he contested the parliamentary primaries at the Sunani East constituency of the MPP, but lost to the former chief whip, uh, the, major, the former chief whip on the MPP side, Kwesi Asoma uh, Chremen, who is a member of parliament for Sunani East. So that, and then this time we are told that uh, he's been nominated. Indeed, I spoke to him last Friday, he confirmed that he was at a particular meeting, and uh, when I spoke to him, he was actually on his way to Sunani, he's going back, back, uh, back and back, mm. and then come back to Accra today uh, to start his work as a deputy. Attorney General. And most of these people, I can tell you for a fact, that even before uh, we hear the official name, they've been working in an unofficial position with some of these men, assisting them, learning on the job ahead of the former announcement and subsequent vetting by Parliament. I can move to gender, children, and social protection. Mm -hmm. The name here is Lariba Tuwira Abudu. Uh, Interior Ministry is Nana Iyia. Youth and Sports Ministry is the former regional minister for the Hapo region, Ivan Bobie, now a deputy. Youth and Sports Minister designate. Defense is uh, Amangpa Menu, he is a member of parliament. Weiwei is uh, Asante Boateng. My information is that this is the former uh, chief executive of the Ghana Publishing uh, Company. He also contested the Nkoko parliamentary primaries and taken of the MP and lost. And he is very much known for his role in Let My Vote Count after the 2012 election. But this time, my information is that he's been nominated for the ministry of uh, railway and that's a target uh, for the employment and labor relations right to recruit will be fish resistant and in roads and highways we have two maybe in Canterbury and saving jack lula communication is i'm a former member of parliament for uh and then and the national resources benito osubio and duka we could do member of parliament for Chaka and Shuayim in the Western region. Foreign affairs, we are going to Thomas Mbomba, Thomas Mbomba, and one Apechum Sapon. Food and agriculture, Yao, Tremponado, and Hadi, Tafiru. Then transport, we have Alhas and Tampoli, and Fudek Adom. For tourism and creative arts, we are learning of our own. Uh, Mark Okwekuma. So these, these are the names that we have uh, with facial so confirmation. Far. So far, well, we'll, we'll cut this. We'll cut this uh, uh, sound bite and then wait for the confirmation and then put it side by side, juxtaposes and see how it goes. But uh, Elton, um, how more? How 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 much more do we have to wait? Because we understood that it was going to be out by three. It's past three already. Are you picking up any information why it's sort of delayed? So I've been checking uh, with people I know at the Jubilee House. In fact, I've been checking with the communication director at Jubilee House. And what I've checked is that this is a communication coming from the president of the republic. And he will decide when he wants to bring it out. But what I've been told is that it is likely to come out today. And hopefully before the close of the day. Remember that when the president released the name of the substantive minister. I think he waited to around 5.30 p.m. before bringing it out. Maybe they are looking at peak time on radio and on television to get the attention of the nation. That's why it can be the delay. But what I know is that all the issues surrounding this particular matter uh, have been dealt with. There is no outstanding issue. Earlier, we were told of some ministers who were not happy with the names uh, or, or the individuals that have been penciled to assist them as deputy ministers in their ministry. Because according to them, despite the constitutional provision that says that this must be done in consultation with the substantive ministers, some of them, uh, my information, were not happy with the fact that they were not consulted. They were only told of the names of the victim on Wednesday. Mm. And they had concerns about some of these things. And I'm told that yesterday's last night meeting, 
iron out some of these differences. So, barring last minute hitches, I are likely to see confirmation of about 99% of the names that I just mentioned uh, when the official list come out. Great. Elton, we're standing by for that list. Thank you so much. Elton Broby is our presidential affairs correspondent there, bringing us up to speed on some names, the names that we've picked up as those who will be appointed as deputy ministers or appointed into deputy ministerial positions. We've taken you through what we have. We wait for the president to release his list. <laughs> Now, all Nigerian community in the Ashanti region says some of its members are reeling under economic hardship following closure of their shops. This comes after a task force formed by the government closed about 92 shops in Suami Magazine, owned by foreigners for violating Ghana Investment Promotion Council laws on retail. Chief Inkem Tony Onyagolu explained resources of their members are locked in the business following the closure. And I with more in this report. For seven months, shops owned by foreigners, mostly Nigerians, have been locked for non-compliance to retail regulations. According to the government, ample time was given for regularization of their businesses. Nana Kwabna Pepra led the team. Oh, it's the it's a GRPC Act 128. Oh, it's first out that if you are a foreigner and you want to do retail trading, all what you have to do is that uh, you have to raise an amount of $1 million or uh, in goose, also $1 million. Then uh, you employ 20 people. Then you apply a certificate from GIPC. Then on that certificate, they will give you a location where you can apply your trading. Affected persons for the period stayed on, hoping for an early reversal, but they say efforts to get the shops reopened have proven futile. Chief Enkem Tony Onyagolu explains members are going through financial difficulty. They, they promise us that uh, we will hear from them very soon. But as you can see, things are getting worse. We, the communities here, especially we in Ashanti, you know, our people are dying because of the, that shop they closed. You know, some people life service is in that shop. Some people even travel document is there. They are, they are goose, whatever people do, take. Meanwhile, the leadership of the community wants authorities to consider meeting affected persons for finality. Chief Oniagolu again. We will be glad to have a meeting with them, conclude on one thing. And that thing will be okay for us, and they will be happy too. I believe we are not here to to subdue or to kill or to take over the business from the, our host country. No, we are here to learn from them, and they too will learn from us. And that's what we have been doing. We have a Nigerian terrorist association. Also, there's a Guta, and government officials will be also in the, involved in the meeting. So I will say, because they, you can't, they can't say Nigerians will not do business here, it's, it's no matter anything. From Kumase for Joy News, Nana Ojima reporting. Still in the region, 10 offices in the administration block of the Mampong College of Education in the Ashanti region have been destroyed by fire this morning. The Mampong fire station had to resort to reinforcement from the Ejra fire station to douse the flame. School authorities say the situation could affect the, would affect the administration activities of the training institution. Prince Apia reports. The fire, according to eyewitnesses, started between 7 and 8 a.m. on Monday. Some say the absence of a fire hydrant compounded the fire to bring the fire under control. I was marking my register around 8 a.m. when I realized there was smoke coming out of the administration block. I quickly called my colleagues. It started around 7.45 8 a.m. If we had gotten here early, 
we could have stopped the fire from spreading. The fire service had to call for reinforcement because the tank was empty. A committee should be set up to investigate what led to the fire. The Edra Fire Station came in with another fire tender to support the Mampong team before the fire was successfully doused. Suleimanu Ayi as divisional officer grade three and the second in command at the Mampo Fire Station. When we came, the fire was on the first floor, on the right hand side. So we were able to survey the whole place. So for now, it's only 10 officers that got bent. But the ground floor, we were able to survey it, so nothing happened there. So for now, everything's under control. For now, we are still with the investigation. We are in investigation. So at the appropriate time, we'll come out with our findings. Meanwhile, school authorities say they have lost school documents to the fire. Dean of Students Douglas Cranton says the situation will affect the day-to-day -day running of the school. I was teaching when I received a call that the administration block is on fire. I quickly called the fire service. The cause of the fire is currently not known. All our documents have been completely burnt. This will affect teaching. Prince Apia reporting. We stay a little longer in the Ashanti region and traders at the leather and footwear section of the Kumasi Central Market have also begun counting their losses after the after fire ravaged more than 30 shops last night. Fire has swept through more than 30 shops uh, in the area and destroying their properties worth thousands of Ghana cities. The fire started on Sunday evening uh, from one of the shops and spread to other structures due to the combustible nature of the burnt items. This section of the market is noted for trading leather and the manufacture of local bags, shoes, slippers, sandals and other footwears. Last night's fire destroyed more than 30 shops that traded in these items. Affected traders have however started counting their losses. One can see traders trying to salvage some of their properties when the news team visited the far scene. I have stocked my shop with leather. Everything has destroyed. We had no access to salvage anything, she says. It was Saturday evening that I restocked the shop with almost 30,000 cities worth of goods. I've lost everything. I had made an investment of 6,000 cities a few days ago in my business, and I've lost everything to this far. Firefighters say they had a hard time dousing the fire because they struggled to get access through the congested market. ACFO Henry Jua is the deputy Ashanti fire officer. Accessibility is always a problem in central market. Even as you can see, we are having a whole lot, a whole lot of challenge. So that's what that one is a, it's a big problem. And the interference from the traders and all those things is no good. So as for the course, we are started investigating, so I can't tell you for now. But for now, approximately about 30 shops have, have, gone, have been involved. Now the National Disaster and Management Organization, NADMO, visited the affected areas this morning to ascertain the extent of damage and offer support for the traders. Abdul Basit Garba is in charge of the Subin Submetro. There are over 40 shops been affected and these people are integral part of the revenue source of the government and no government will want anyone to be idle without doing anything so if they are going to be relocated we will consider it if not if they could manage doing something here before the, um, the second phase will reach here we will consider that one too 
Meanwhile, city authorities say the affected areas are not part of the phase two of the Kenyatta Redevelopment Project. Let's still stay a little longer in this region. Asanko Gold Mines has suspended operations following a violent confrontation between its security operatives and youth of communities within the mines catchment area in the Amansia South District of the Ashanti region. The mining company alleges that community members are stealing gold ore from its dump site and mining illegally on its concession. Manaya Jima reports the legal mine, illegal mining activities on the concession threatens the future of Asanko, my, Asanko Gold Mines. Community guys were actually picking uh, the material from the marginal section and then there was uh, a little confrontation between. A video in circulation shows remnants of the last confrontation between some members of the community and security operatives stationed at the mine. Some individuals from both sides were injured, mining equipment owned by Rockshaw a contractor to Asanko Mines were also vandalized. The mining company has video footage of community members allegedly trooping to the site to steal gold ore. It's happening live. It's happening live. Illegal mining is rife within the 113 kilometer Asanko Mine concession. This Galamse site is a few meters away from the senior staff camp of the mine. These illegal miners have assembled gold washing points powered by chamfer machines. The emboldened miners ceased work temporarily to observe the arrival of the police military escort to the area. Vice President for Asanko Mines, Charles Amwa, explains environmental destruction is hampering Asanko's sustainable mining drive. Um, just digging anywhere which is affecting our environmental bond that uh, we have with the EPA. In the production side? On the production side, you can see that they are mining ahead of us and they're taking all the houses which we have projected to mine, thereby shortening the life of mine that we have. The situation at Esuade is worse compared to the previous site. As far as the eye can see, the illegal miners are spotted all over the area, busily searching for gold. They are not bothered by the presence of the team. Some of them claim the area has been declared a community mining site, which the regional security council refutes. Some Chinese and local miners with heavy equipment are digging other parts of the mine concession. You can see the Galamseyers competing with our heavy duty equipment like the dozers, the excavators, the dump trucks on the rum stockpile, which is the runoff mine stockpile competing to collect or let me say to steal gold and also areas that we are operating they also come there and they pose a safety risk to our company the ashanti regional security council is intervening to protect the mine's future head of the council simon osai mensa spoke to love news after observing the level of destruction the level of encroachment is very very serious you all realize that when we went there and they saw us they didn't even run away, they were just looking at, at us, some of them so carrying out their duties as if the place is theirs. I think this thing must end. If people within communities are interested in, in engaging in mining activities, either they go for legal small scale mining license and operate within the conditions and terms of the license, or they approach their this is the chief executive who will work in collaboration with the member of parliament and the regional coordinating council to ensure that maybe they get, they, they are enrolled in the community mining project. Love news checks indicate the local communities are agitated at the delay in the release of over $1.7 million accrued through the sale of gold mined by Asanku. The amount is their share of the proceeds of gold mined by the company. These are part of issues the RECSEC is seeking to resolve. For Joy News, Nane Ochima reporting. Motorists who use the Pukwasi stretch of the Accra Kumasi Highway are being urged to brace themselves for slight interruptions in traffic flow at least for the next four weeks.
weeks. This, according to contractors in charge of the Pukwase interchange, is to allow for the completion of an overhead footbridge on the strait. On Monday morning, a gridlock at the Pukwase junction left a crab-bound motorist spending hours on distances which ordinarily took minutes to complete. While they demand the speedy completion of the project, safety manager in charge of the construction project, Frederick Norte, has been assuring of efforts to mitigate the impact of works on the footbridge on traffic flow. On all Cranting spent the day on the street. This is the situation and it's been like this for close to four solid hours. We're told that the traffic started building up around 4.30 a.m. with motorists who are Accra bound, some, some from in Saom, some, and this is of course the uh, Accra Kumase Highway. The problem we are told is that due to ongoing construction on the uh, Pokwasi interchange, there's been a diversion to allow for further works. And that has, and of course, because of the rains last night, a lot of the chippings that were filled have been washed away. And this become a, a real problem uh, for the motorists who have been plying this particular route. On the other side of the road, which is Kumasi bound, we see a free flow of, uh, you know, vehicles and so on. But for, let, let me try and speak to a few of them. My boss, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Yeah, trust you're doing well. What? Trust you're doing well, sir. Yeah. Well, how long have you been in the traffic? It's getting to four hours. Getting to four hours. What? Wh wh where's this? Where's this traffic building up from? I, I I don't know the actual place, but I coming from Kumasi. But you are is just telling me that he's been in the traffic for two hours. Uh, great, great morning to you. Good morning. How, how is the journey so far? No be easy, boss. No be easy. No be easy. Why, where did they come from? I they come from Ajay Kotoku. Ajay Kotoku. Better one every day, you know. Yeah. How many hours you chop? Oh, I chop two hours. Two hours. Yes. Why normally be two hours in the chop? No, because of the change of uh, this thing. You know. the, the interchange, you know. Okay, so I mean, as they start, they do the interchange or this problem day? No, 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 no. So today we make make really serious. Yeah, let's say this week, the yeah, the problem come. So maybe me load up if you cross my. I mean, come on, come on. Because in traffic, no, I know what the intimate means. Some me too far, my era old road now now my era no so. I also stole traffic, oh. okay. and I'm a very far man. Tell you, as okay. and I'm a teasing. Wow, I see. I see you go for an anchor or on back with you. Oh, Nipa go, okay. but now make us a me for one. Maybe I mean, yeah, and like my quantum to make your money now. It's raw, and you see, I mean, you couple go. I see traffic in Tina with your money now. Traffic in Tina made your money now. Not say more, more to not traffic moose and a problem being a pet as a perpetual share and a visa. Oh, we're patrolling here. We're still patrolling now for uh, traffic. Mm -hmm. right. But this particular point, um, the intersection where uh, folks from this side of the road join the main Accra Kumase Highway, that has been the problem. That has been the source of the traffic that we've seen for the past four hours uh, on this particular street. But these are some of the folks who actually, you know, work, live, and you know, do most of the activities around this area let, let me just speak to him uh, boss now i say any traffic no abano eh 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 nyade eh hu de bia ni bi oh of course any normal eh this na bia tie na o ma block ho there's a gutter down there okay na road no mo yenti no there's a gutter down there there's a gutter down there gutter down there okay. what 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 happened to that gutter o ma si no and it's a ma road no yenti now camera for nice man person in table for no so there's a gutter down there that has been blocked. Of course, there's a gutter down there that has been blocked. Okay. And yesterday raining. There's a heavy rain yesterday okay. because because there's no gutter there. The rain falls and go down. I mean, there's no over there. You see, understand? That's why you see there's a lot of more traffic. A lot of more traffic. So 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 there's an underground gutter. Under gutter. Beha a, uh, under under the road. Under the road. Beneath the road. Yeah, under the road. But it's been blocked. It's been blocked. It's and, been blocked. And, and this is this. We're standing on one of the covets. This is. I can see water. You know, guarded in, in, in this yeah. one. Yeah, you see, you see there's a gutter that's yeah. going. The same gutter that the right side. Okay. And it's, it's not working. Okay, that one it's, is choked. It's choked. It's blocked. It's not working. That's why you see a lot of traffic there because there's, I mean, there's a hole there. Okay. Because of yesterday raining. That's like the rain falls and then there's a hole there. That's why it couldn't go. 
So we can currently see that the vehicular traffic is moving smoothly. This was after an intervention from uh, the contractors on site uh, who filled that hole with uh, some uh, silt and so on. And now we are able to see the vehicles moving. But let me just try and speak to the safety manager um, at the project site to get some explanation on what exactly was the cause of um, the great lock in the morning. Uh, Mr. Frederick Norte is a safety manager. Grateful that you could speak to me. Just, just give me an understanding of what exactly happened today. Okay, good morning to you, your cherished cherish, uh, listeners. Uh, this morning, there was a, a rainfall a night before, and that was the cause of the traffic. We've done a little ramp just within the diversion, which uh, we use the quarry dust. So it gets soaked by the rain, and there were some depressions, which caused the little delay in traffic. So immediately, we noticed that we came to the, uh, the, 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 the road to ensure that it was evenly leveled to allow traffic to flow easily. And, and you say what, this was temporary. Is this something that happens on irregular? Because I was speaking to some of the motorists who say that well, traffic on this road is not a new thing. Yeah, we usually experience traffic during the peak hours. Uh, that is from 6.30 all the way to 8.30. Uh, that is a peak period, and most commuters are moving around those times. So even before the project commenced, that has been the trend. There is a little bit of traffic delay during the peak period. But if in the, in the course of the peak period there are slight uh, uh, distractions, that uh, worsens the traffic situation. But, but explain to me, what is the reasoning for using quarry dust um, for that diversion on the ramp? Yeah, the reason for using the quarry dust is because the road has already been asphalted okay. and uh, any other material that uh, 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 is used could uh, impact on the surface condition. So we don't want the surface condition to be badly impacted after we've diverted the traffic to the main uh, uh, traffic route. Okay, so what, what necessitated that diversion in the first place? Okay, as you could see, uh, we are constructing currently the footbridge, the pedestrian footbridge, which uh, we have extended a little bit beyond the northbound traffic. That is the traffic that says commuters from Accra to Kumasi. So that has necessitated the diversion to enable us to traverse along that uh, uh, area. Maybe in a matter of about four weeks, we'll be done with that construction and therefore the traffic will revert to its normal route and to ease the, uh, the, the traffic distraction that we have. Well, let, let me understand, just for the sake of uh, motorists who plied this route, you say that this situation is going to persist for the next four weeks? The traffic uh, 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 delays are not going to persist for the next four, week, four weeks. We are going to maintain the, 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 the motorability of the road within that uh, uh, period to ensure that any time there are depressions, they are quickly addressed and filled to allow uh, 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 commuters to move quite quickly within the project enclave. Manuel Kranting there. We hear from the residents who are complaining about the uh, blockade that has happened on that part of the bridge in the Sagnarugu Municipal Assembly. We're looking for this contractor to come and tell us something uh, reasonable. We can't find him. So we are appealing to the government and the DC that they should come and see what is happening here because we are all human beings. When you just cross here, you, you can't do anything again. Why? So we are saying, even if you come and look at the iron rocks the contractor is using, we are not happy with it. But he should just come and give us a temporary road which all of us can pass. Look at look look at all these uh, ma machines here, vehicles here. All of us are suffering. So that is our appeal to the government. This is not a matter of politics. We should remove MPP and DC in this matter and fight for our right because we are all Ghanaians. Nobody should do politics with this thing. Thank you. The bridge plan, the contractor, the, those who are working there said they don't have any plan on that. And we said the iron rocks they are using, they were using. 14 to, to, to do the tour. We, we needed to know the tour, whether it's four feet down or three feet. Because as, as when you are, you are constructing a bridge, it is the tour that is the most important thing. So when we requested for those things, they said they don't have plan based on those things. So we have seen that secondary, the iron roads are used. It is a main road. And the heavy trucks are always on this road. So 
we, we say we want to see and get the actual plan and the air roads they are using, we are not satisfied with that one. And it is getting to the decision. So we want to get the proper diversion. We asked the contractor, he told us that uh, there's no any, the diversion money is not part of his contract. So we needed to, we would need to make a better diversion so that you can now do it well with the proper materials. And that, that, that if you want to use that, you want to do the short work for us, we will not Works engineer at the Sagnarugu Municipal Assembly, Baba Isa, has also been responding to the concerns raised by the residents you heard there. Was given. The contract was given about uh, two months back. Two months back? Yes. <laughs> and it took you how long to mobilize and come? We, Considering we, that we were expecting rain and that has always been an issue here. It, 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 it came about a month. I was so. It came to about a month. That was the time we got to do it. When you stand upon that of time, so you you it takes one month to mobilize, but it's two months now. I pass here a lot, and since I started passing, I have seen this thing like this for the past three weeks. What has changed? No, initially we didn't know that we were going to pass. We didn't know that we were going to pass. That was what brought about the stance. When are you expected to finish? It's a six month contract. But we kept on telling him that this one, we should be mindful of the weather. Because this is a major And what the part is here? We are able to work within that time. Community will be part of So we kept on the What brought about the delay was the initial arrangement. Now resources is always a problem. Has he got the capacity? Martina Bugri with that report there. Now today the country is facing a grim prospect of a setback in the vaccination program due to the unavailability of vaccines to inoculate nearly 800,000 Ghanaians who have already taken their first jabs. The well, government over the weekend explained that it is exploring ways to bring in more doses, revealing that second jabs will take place in May, a four-week extension of the second dose schedule. A public health expert and virologist at the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research, Dr. Michael Owusu, is warning those who have taken the first jab will lose or could lose the protection if the second dose doses do not arrive in time we'll hear from him shortly first listen to director general of the ghana health service dr patrick kumar Bwaji, explaining government's efforts to secure the second doses we have received a total of 966,850 vaccines 600,000 from the covax facility 50,000 from my, as a donation from the Indian government. We have um, 165,000 from MTN Africa, and then 149,000 as a second also from MTN Africa, uh, bringing the total about 315,000 from the MTN uh, group. Based on some of the WHO recommendations, how to deploy uh, AstraZeneca. The recommendation is that. Uh, it has to be the dosage of between 8 to 12 weeks interval doses. That is, you know, as far as vaccination is concerned, what we have most important is the minimum time within which a second shot or booster dose can be given. If you do it before that minimum date, you will not get any benefit. But sometimes the longer you wait, it still doesn't matter that you can still have your second shot and get your booster dose uh, build up. The WHO have done a lot of studies and has also shown that number one is that if you give it before four weeks or before two weeks, there's virtually no benefit. But between two, 12, eight, and 12 weeks is the best time to give. 
We'll be hearing more from the experts, but I have Dr. Patrick Kumabwaji joining me on the line right now. Let's engage him quickly and understand where we stand. Doc, thank you very much for your time. We understand you're in a meeting and you've had to excuse yourself for this. We appreciate it. First of all, uh, I want to just find out with the eight to 12 weeks, uh, you said, now we're looking at 12 weeks because we don't have the second uh, batch yet. But what progress have we made with in terms of definitive dates for the next consignment? Yeah, thank you very much. I think your second statement about we are moving to 8 to 12 weeks because we have not have the second, but that's not what it is. The issue with the science of it is the fact that it has come to become clear that between 8 and 12 weeks, the one that gives you the best uh, response. And that's why we are moving to that. So remember, we started as the original of those four weeks. And then based on further assessments, so that deemed that at 12, 8 and 12 is the best time. Currently, more studies are ongoing. There's evidence that even the longer might be better. But as you said, you take the 8 weeks. It's at the time we were given 8 weeks, other countries were given 12 weeks. By the 8 weeks, what's appear on the, the earliest time you can have it. Any time you take the vaccine before 8 weeks, you will not get the benefit that we all desire. And that is why... We are moving into the, the 12 weeks, after which we know that the vaccine will be a vaccine for the second dose. And mind you, we are not so, we are not only worried about the second dose. I'm 29, there are many, many other Ghanaians who are not even received their first dose. Mm. And so there's a lot of effort going on to ensure that they also get their first dose. And I think, in terms of equity, we must also think about the people who are not even received one at all. And so that's why we are working hard on to ensure that as we give the second dose, we get enough vaccines for others to receive their first dose. Doc, I took the first, uh, the first shot, and there are several people like myself who are asking the question, when next? Which was my second question that uh, perhaps now you can address for me. I mentioned that earlier, but after you answered the first one, I think it got, it got drowned in there. Let's highlight, yeah. it. Let's highlight it a little bit. Have we made progress? We know the situation in, in, in India is not looking good. The, the cases have gone up. We know what's happening in Brazil. So it's a very difficult time for the entire world. But we are making our own, uh, you told us that we are making our own, um, taking our own steps to be able to meet that expectation of the second yeah. dose. Have we made any progress in terms of securing definite dates in May that we'll be getting the well, next? Well, definite date. Um, nobody can give a very definite date. And so what we have done, we have bilateral arrangements for vaccines. We are working with COVAX, who has also given assurance that May will come in. We are also working with um, the with the, the factories like Serum Institute, etc., engaging to see how we get. So we are doing multiple approaches. Mm. In addition, we are also looking at other vaccines, like Sputnik, and Johnson and Johnson that will come in. So there's a lot of multiplicity of approaches that we're using. All we can say is that we are working towards ensuring that by May, for which more people are still within the the zone of eight to twelve weeks and now there's even a talk of a longer period, mm. uh, which gives a better uh, response. We'll meet that deadline. And most importantly, we're towards getting other people receive their first because the mm. The more people are vaccinated, the better it is for us to be able to bring this uh, pandemic under control. And so we are not only focusing on the second dose, but also ensuring that the larger number, the population, the 20 million that was supposed to be vaccinated, we are still working within that kind of and working to protect the vaccinated. I, 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 I appreciate, I appreciate the, the, the point you make about making sure that those who have not received the first shot in the first place do get it and that's something that i'll come to shortly uh, just a few minutes we will spend on that but 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 what i wanted to find out again is the guarantees that we have i understand also the point that we can't have definite definitive dates at this point but what guarantees do we have that our multi um uh, uh the approaches that you say you are exploring will actually yield uh, you know, some fruit for us by May? I would say we are fairly certain, but I don't, nobody can give anybody a guarantee. We are fairly certain that our arrangements are solid enough and that uh, we will get. Mm. We got that push that we will get within the next the period that is left. For the earliest, even for the 
earliest group that we'll have, and if you are doing the 12 weeks, which other countries will be about towards the end of May. And that is when the second dose would start. And so we are certain that we'll be able to okay. uh, meet that deadline. But like I said, the most important thing is that how do we ensure that more Ghanaians get vaccinated? And I think we must focus more on that. Okay. But the, focusing more, Doc, on those who have not had the first shot at all, we understand that there's a part of the country where we're experiencing vaccine hesitancy and so we're getting some of the doses expire i know that less yesterday you explained a bit of that but is it fair to ask whether or not we can use those in places where people are hesitant about receiving it to give those doses as second doses because they are astrazeneca to those who have taken the first dose well i think this hesitancy is your own conclusion i don't know where you got that conclusion from that it was expired because of hesitancy there was a spiraling because we had a very short time to deliver a lot of vaccines. And delivering of COVID vaccine requires a lot of database assessment and supply. And moving around, and because you are not doing campaign mode, people are moving to places. And so that doesn't make it as fast as we are wish. But it is not about hesitancy. There's hesitancy somewhere in all regions. There's no one region that can say there's more hesitancy there than there. There is some level of uh, apprehension. Okay. That, and that, but eventually they say, because there are more people, there's more demand on the vaccines you have than what we can actually supply. So one cannot really say okay. that, for example, the whole of Northern region, there was so much expense that we couldn't deliver 10,000 vaccines to people. Okay. So it's more about the terrain and the time we had to deliver uh, those vaccines that came in quite late. And, that, and the time and the fact that they had a very short life and left. And that is what it is. It's not about hesitancy. Okay, I'm just trying to, uh, and I'm indicating this hesitancy. Like you said, at least you've indicated that it's not like there isn't hesitancy. There is, and, and, and expected, expectedly so. All that I'm Everywhere. trying to do. Everywhere. Very well, very well. All, very well. all that I'm trying to do. All that I'm trying to do, Doc, is just to find out whether or not it's possible to, while we work on people's hesitancy, to bring those uh, doses to as, and use them as second doses for those who are taking the first shot. Just trying to work out the solutions here, in my mind. No, I believe that those who had the first shot was because of the segmentation. These are the ones who qualified. Okay. It was not because somebody didn't take it because there was hesitancy. And that's what I want you to understand, that there was a segmentation of essential people who needed to have the first shot. And that's what we did. And so based on that, we are going to continue with them on the second dose. But we are also going to look into the next stage of group who also need to have their vaccination. And so whatever we have, we are not going to abandon the second dose, but we are going to more focus on making sure that we have vaccines for the rest of Ghanaians who have not even had Okay. We were also told that we were purchasing some, apart from the, the, the COVAX and the bilateral arrangements, other bilateral arrangements that we had, that we were also purchasing some of the AstraZeneca. Am I wrong? And where are we with that? Yes, there are a lot of efforts to do that, including even the private sector efforts in trying to bring in back. And so there's a lot of multiplicity of approach. So we are working on that. At the right time, to be in, you know, there's a lot of. Um, no bad shortage of vaccines. There's everywhere countries are storing them and not releasing them, uh, nationalism and etc. So it's not as simple as that, but I think there's significant effort has been made. I believe that we will get vaccines to, to, to vaccinate that in. Hmm. And, and you talked about the Sputnik V that has uh, arrived. Uh, ha just help me out here. What is the plan for the Sputnik V? We think that arrived is quite small, the initial dose. We are expecting uh, a larger dose, and that one will be given to uh, other parts of the country based on the same segmentation that we are looking at. So who are the next terms of the, the roll-up plan? They will be the ones to receive any vaccine that can, whether it's Johnson & Johnson or Sydney, whatever. We're going to follow strictly the segmentation. Doc, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get you another time so we break it down further and get some more assurances.
and and shared and shared some more uh, uh, uh doc are you still there sorry just a quick one um regarding the expired vaccines in the northern region uh, do we have any updates on that yes i think it's not thousands um northern region had 48 vials left which is 180 shots and then ot had 10 shots vials left so in total it was 400 580 shots that could not be used because of the five. Okay. So this is Volta and OT and not the northern yeah. region? No, no, no. Volta. No, no. No. It's northern region oh. and OT. Northern. Okay. And OT. Northern and OT. All other regions were regions. able to de uh, deliver all their back. Okay. Except for northern and OT region that had 580 shots expired. But mind you that access and terrain plays a role in this. So uh, these are regions with very difficult terrain uh, to work with. Well, so the government is not as smooth as if you are doing in Accra or Kumasi or other places. Mm. Hopefully we won't have any of such uh, exp expirations since uh, we are I already... Think we, will, we, will, we will take the lessons from that to see how we will expand the team to make sure it's done quickly. Uh, so that's fine. It's a lesson that we also use in improving our approach. Okay. Dr. Patrick Kumabwaje, thank you. Dr. Patrick Kumabwaje is Director General of the Ghana Health Service. You've heard him explain a lot of the things. He's indicated that we are fairly certain, that's the expression he uses, we are fairly certain that we will receive um, the next tranche so that we can have our doses, those, those of us who have taken the first dose by May, as suspected. He also talks about Sputnik V, but he says that the ones that the, the, the ones we've received aren't enough. So we're hoping to get more of that. He says that, yeah, it's not, there have been some expired doses, but that was not because of vaccine hesitancy has been uh, reported. 580 shots, he says, not the thousands that were earlier reported. 580 shots. But... Between 8 and 12 weeks, if you have taken the first shot like me, he says you should rest assured that you are well protected between this time. Ready for your sports now. And days after Keto Kroku sensitization tour of the Bono region, there has been yet another violent act in the Ghana Premier League. Head coach of Ebusian Dwarfs, N.S. Thompson Korte, was physically assaulted by angry fans of Brecum Chelsea in a week 20 tie at the Golden City Park. The Dwarfs coach has been narrating his ordeal. These guys who just came to our bus when our luggages were being brought out, opened our bags, took our dresses with their uh, claim that we had to do in the bag and all that stuff. Then we went and asked him why that issue. Then we uh, packed and we went into the um, dressing room. We came out for the first half, we played the first half. We said our prayer with the players, and just when we were going back to the dressing room, there were about 30 supporters in front of the dressing room. They said they wanted to search me because they were uh, suspecting I had to do on me. So when I said no, it was only my phones and other things, they forced fully opened my zip and all that. And when I was trying to resist, they started punching me, held my leg, I fell down. Some were kicking, some were just uh, 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 punching me. Just look at, look at me. Look at, look at me. Look at me. Okay, I can look see at, your, 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 sh even, uh, your, your shirt uh, is torn. And I have your wallet too with me. It was brought by a supporter. I don't even remember I, I, my, my wallet is even missing. I've not even realized it. So, well, this is this is shocking, but, well, how did you see the entire game? I wouldn't my want brother, to... because of this happening, mm. it took us off gear. Yeah, because at the second half, I couldn't mm. start on the touchline. You understand it? It's, it's bad. This shouldn't be happening in Ghana football in these days and age. Okay. We have come of age. We are in a scientific world. To be pulled out, kick and all that because of a football match. I have a family at home. I can't die because of football. It's bad. 
Well, that's uh, Ernest Thompson, the Ibusia Dwarfs coach, there narrating what happened to him in that uh, manner. Well, hooliganism, as is now being called in football, has been a conversation that's been going on, especially the whole of last week. You had Keto Kroku, who is the president of the Ghana Football Association, in an extensive conversation with my colleague uh, Gary Al Smith talking about hooliganism. We also had the the public affairs director for the police uh, service, Sheila Kese Abiyi Buckman, also speak about it. Let's bring you back that conversation on what they've been saying about it so far. In an interview on Joy Sports Link, president of the Ghana Football Association, Ket Okreku, called on the Ghana police to act against hooligans who threaten the sanctity of Ghana football. I sit here and I wholeheartedly condemn hooliganism. That has uh, that has that has been noticed, or that has uh, happened in in some of the league centres. Yes. In some of the league centres, yeah. realise that punishment alone is not enough to eradicate hooliganism. Yes. It's important that we re-preach the gospel of respecting the rules and regulations of the sport. What you have been prosecuted? All, Nobody First of all, has been... you expect, yes. I'm not the, sorry, I'm not the IGP. Yes. Sorry, I'm not the police commander. Yeah. Of course, I'm not the IGP. The, the <laughs> officers are on the ground. <laughs> and what we can do is to continuously remind them about the need for them to help the football system. Yes. One week ago, the police were attacked by, 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 by um, um, supporters. Techiman City against uh, um, Tamale City. I expect the police service to act. Following the comments of the GFA president, the police service reacted in an interview with Joy Sports. Superintendent Sheila Abeye Bachman, director of public affairs of the Ghana Police Service Department, told Joy Sports the core mandate of the police service at March Venus is to protect lives and property. Our presence at football matches, we are ensuring general security, but also security for the officials. Oh. So this will be the referees and the match commissioners. Security for the playing body. Security for spectators. Security for properties that are in the stadium and surrounding areas. We go with the mentality of protecting these subjects that I mentioned and often prepare ourselves with um, right and control disposition. Many have often accused the Ghana Police Service of doing little to help fight hooliganism in Ghana football. Despite their ever presence, most police officers are often seen separating hooligans from attacking match officials. Superintendent Bachman warned that the police will not hesitate to arrest and prosecute if they are given no option. Match officials to do what is right for the beginning so that their actions don't trigger actions that call for arresting people later on for prosecutions but having said this should anybody go to any stadia or any field football playing field to conduct him or herself in a manner that the law gives authority to police to arrest and prosecute you leave us with no option than to arrest you and prosecute you. The GFA president is currently on a tour of the Bono and Northern regions to engage the police high command, clubs and fans as the association seek to end hooliganism in Ghana football. That's your sports this hour. Wrapping it, wrapping it up now with Let's Talk Showbiz. But let me just remind you that there's more news at myjoyonline.com. I'll urge you to log on. Click on the story shared with your contacts. Nigerian jailbreakers rearrested in Ghana after crossing Volta River. And that's the story there. 
Uh, we have also stories from the NDC's meetings that were held over the weekend. You want to take a look at those stories, share it with your contact. Like I said, we'll do this again tomorrow. My name is Gifty and Dr. Pia. Many thanks for your time.